on guys, it's Ricky from Volney Capital. We are here for another live interview. Um, extremely excited for today's interview. We have Sean Conlin. Uh, he is the host of The Deed Chicago on CNBC. It's gonna be an awesome opportunity to ask questions from someone who has not only knowledge when it comes to kitchen designs or bathroom designs, but all aspects of real estate. So. Throughout this entire interview, please send over the questions in the comments field. We'll make sure to try to get to every single question we can uh, throughout the interview. And then uh, we'll, at the end, we'll get to a bunch more. So uh, make sure to send them over. Um, looks like we have him joined in, so we'll get this started right away. Hello. Sean. There How he is. Good. How are <laughs> nice you? Nice to see you. A little, you technical, a little technical challenge there down in Palm Beach, so I'm better at home flipping than I am technology. <laughs> How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. I'm making the best of a bad situation, hoping everybody's safe out there. But your show is very good. It's great. People Thank get you. obsessed with kitchens when they're in isolation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're trying to put out some content for the people while they're at home. Uh, let people ask questions live really gives people the ability to interact. We found that, you know, the live interviews has been, uh, you know, great over the past couple of weeks. And we're extremely excited to have you on. Um, I know I'm excited to hear your story. So, I mean, let's start and just where did it all begin? And how okay. did you end up where you're at today? I'll make it as quick as possible. Well, obviously excited to be here on Kitchens yeah. of Insta. I uh, grew up in Ireland, um, working class background, seven of us in a house, dreamed a lot, spent too much time in the library. And the library told me that if you came to America, you could be anything you wanted. Uh, I rocked up here and obviously it wasn't paid for gold initially. I worked as a janitor, actually an <laughs> assistant janitor, and I installed some really bad kitchens. <laughs> uh, and then I decided to try and sell real estate. And I did it part time for six months and I sucked and <laughs> got a break. And uh, four more years later, I was the top selling broker possibly in North America. Amazing. Again. Yes. Yeah. So when you were back back then, when you were on the brokerage side of the business, did you did you have the passion for the design and for the construction and the development side, or was did you not see yourself getting to that side of the business back then? Oh no, I was. I the reason I ended up in brokerage was, you know, the Irish have an affinity for owning buildings and real estate, and it's, there's a historical perspective that I won't bore you with. But I was obsessed with owning buildings and designing buildings. And I had a real affinity for old buildings. The first really cool thing I owned was an old funeral home. Awesome. And Very cool. I redid the attic where they stored the coffins as my apartment. Nice. Yeah, um, cool. So what, so in, in your business now, obviously you're on the Deed Chicago, uh, you know, on CNBC, season finale is tonight. Um, what, are, what are all the aspects of the business right now uh, that you're, you know, that you're currently working in all aspects of real estate? Yeah, no, my business is quite complicated now. I, I won't bore too much, but I own a real estate merchant bank. And basically what I structure is simply condensed. I have a trillion dollar network, meaning I can pick the phone up to people who are worth $20 billion and call them at home. So I connect capital with real estate deals across the globe. So yeah. I will sometimes raise a billion dollars for a real estate deal in Europe. So that's yeah. kind of my thing. And then I buy pieces of companies that are real estate related that I can have an impact on. Yeah, awesome. Well, let's jump into more of the design side. So when yes. you're looking at, you know, stuff from, you know, kitchen's perspective, what, what, what design trends are you seeing right now? And, you know, what trends are you using in your own projects or recommending that people in your network use? And, and what trends are you saying, stay away from, you know, this is too specific? You know, it's, it's interesting. Obviously, I've been in the business quarter of a century and I've seen all the trends come, the maple cabinets and stuff. But the one thing that has remained pretty consistent is like a, a wonderful Carrera marble, clean mm -hmm. white countertop. Now, there'll be a debate about how it handles stains and stuff. And one of our shows actually, possibly even tonight, we discuss, you know, granite versus something else. But yeah. I love, I love that Carrera. What I do see a lot of right now is kind of those gray or blue colored kitchens. And I don't mean obnoxious blue, but a very country kitchen. I think yeah. it originated in England initially. It's quite interesting to see that against a really contemporary home. It works really well. Yeah. And I see some of them on your site here. 
Yeah, how about, yeah, so what about the brass and the gold trends? Do you think it's coming back in? Do you think it's going to stick around? Or is that, we're going to, in one year, we're going to go, why did we put that in? Yeah, so, again, this is my personal opinion. I think people are going to go, oh, God, that's awful. I've yeah. never been a fan of gold, <laughs> and I can't get my head around brass. So I think you're right. I think that's a trend that will be it's gone. Fu it's fun right now, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like velour pants. Yeah. I mean, it was great for a, for a summer in the 80s. Um, so when, when someone's looking at renovating their own home or a flip or something like that, what are the areas of the home they should concentrate on? And where are they going to see the most value? I, I always say selling a home um, is like your first date. So try not to show up in like a really bad pink suit. It's curb appeal. You can only make a good impression once, a first impression once. And the first thing people see when they pull up to the home is the front of the house. So I always tell people, spend money on the front of the house and the landscaping, because that is your first impression. And if I pull up in front of the house and I feel really good, I'm gonna overlook some of the flaws inside. Yeah. How about on a rental property? So do you, how do you, do you think that renters pay as close attention to exterior curb appeal? Or do you think that they're more, you know, that's something we debate on is on a rental development. It's really more, it's less likely that they're not going to rent because of the exterior. Yeah. You're, you you're correct. You're correct. So in selling a home is curb appeal. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, renting, people want nice new paint, right? New carpet, yeah. nice floors, a good kitchen. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, that's generally, you know, not to undersell it. There's some incredibly... Listen, I used to rent a home for $100,000 a month. Now, I didn't personally rent it. I couldn't afford it. I rented it out to somebody. Yeah. Uh, they had different expectations. Right. But in your general rental, if you want fresh paint, it needs to feel bright, that's it. Yeah. So where, where do you think the best area is that people shouldn't spend money on a flip? So where they should hold back on their spending, where you've seen people make the mistake of jumping in and, and they put way too much of their budget into something and you say, you didn't need to do that. Yeah, so I see a lot of that in lighting. People spend an awful lot of, look, you can bring me into a light store and you'll see on the D Chicago and CNBC, shameless plug, but no. I'll go into a light store. I don't have a clue. And we end up finding on the first episode, light fixtures for like a hundred bucks that she was going to pay 1500 bucks. Yeah. So yeah. lighting's massively important. I think the marbles and, and tiles and stone you use there are some incredible ceramic alternatives right now. Psychologically, I can't get over, I would want a marble or granite. I can't tell the difference between right. some of the ceramic tiles these days. Yeah, no, there's some amazing options out there. If you're looking to do a flip, don't just go and rush into jumping into the local t tile store that has only like, you know, 10 selections. Go online, source some samples, amazing options out there. Um, we're going to play a little game. So we call this game uh, This or That. Okay. Right? So we, we've been playing this with, we've had guests the past month or so, HGTV people, we got you on here. We're going to, so we, we got a little list put together. So first up, a larger master suite or an extra bedroom in a house? So do you want me to be the sort of single guy living in Palm Beach giving that answer? <laughs> or do you want me to be the practical, pragmatic businessman? Which... Practical business, practical businessman. The bedroom, the extra bedroom, I'm afraid. I'll tell you a quick story. I have always made, I've done well in real estate. I suck when it's my home. I'm the only guy you've known who's had an 8,000 square foot one bedroom apartment. <laughs> now I've simplified my, I could never sell my properties. So you're like, oh, they're amazing. Are you ever thinking of selling it? And when I came to try and sell it, I couldn't because I didn't yeah. do any of the things you're advising people to do. <laughs> 8,000 square foot, one bed. Yeah, um, I'm a moron. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you could have found some spots in there for some more bedrooms. <laughs> of course uh, I could. <laughs> all right, next up, finished basement or outdoor space? Finished basement, practically. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, particularly in northern climes, you're not going to use the outdoor space that much. Look, it's wonderful to have outdoor space, but a finished basement is so important. And you'll see that tonight on the show. Yeah. Um, discussion. Yeah. And then, uh, all right, next up, location of a sink. Would you prefer putting the kitchen sink in the island or up against the exterior walls 
or on a wall? I think generally speaking against the wall. It yeah. feels more practical and the sink can be messy in the island. What mm -hmm. I do like about the island is, you know, it's where people congregate. And so a kitchen sink there, I think, makes that a little less easy. Right. Um, next up on the sink standpoint, farm sink or undermount sink? So I love a farm sink, but in the appropriate setting. I think an undermount sink is very nice in, you know, cosmopolitan cities and stuff. Then if you get to the holiday home, the country home, I like the alternative. Yeah. Um, next one up, how about, so the staple of any kitchen, are we talking white cabinets or are we, or should these people be mixing in some color? I've seen colors mix in very well. I've seen where they have a different color island yeah. Right, which is really cool. Maybe a piece of furniture made that the island sits on. Uh, I personally can't, I can't stand white cabinets, but I know some of them are very cool and contemporary. I just can't handle them. Yeah. Um, all right, how about- Bye, white cabinet people. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get some haters in here. Um, we How about flat panel cabinetry, the more modern, or yeah. the shaker style? I'm good with flat panel with the right colors. Yeah. And, and again, you, I see you, that a lot in, so I live in London part of the time, and I see them do that very well with the flat panels with the cool kind of gray, bluey country colors. Then with a very cool apartment, you know, like very, maybe like 1700s apartment, but that feels very contemporary. That works really well. Great. Um, all right, so we've got some questions coming in. Uh, first question came in from Michelle uh, Lodi. She said, what about porcelain countertops? Good or bad? I mean, I personally have never used them in anything, so I'm going to say bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for the, for the majority of the people on here, porcelain countertops, it's, it's, it's just a route that you don't have to go down. There's quartz, which allows you more stability, less risk of cracks or breaking, right. and you don't need to do the same amount of support on the edges or the overhang. So for someone watching, I'd say quartz is the best option. If you're looking at a higher level of design, you could jump over to something with a porcelain. Right. And you'll see on our show, we use a lot of quartz because it's, it's so brilliant these days, right? Yeah. And we had a full lesson on the show about it also, which I took because in all my years in the business, I didn't always pay attention to it. Yeah. So, so yeah, let's talk, let's talk about quartz. So, you know, obviously it's, it's grown and grown and grown. I think the, the quality has gotten better and better. It looks more and more like stone. So is that your preferred countertop? It's, it's something it's you my like preferred to over and over. It's yeah. my preferred countertop for home flips or anything you're selling or renting. Yeah. You know, in my personal homes, hence the fact I lose money every time I try to sell one, <laughs> I like a stone. Yeah. Right? So, if that yeah. answers your question. So, yeah. But if you're in the business of selling homes or flipping homes or renting homes or apartments, mm -hmm. I would go with the quartz alternative, not stone. Yeah. All right. Next up, we've got um, from Modern Farmhouse Glam asks tips for an outdoor living space. Well, how's the best way to add value to an outdoor living space? OK, so if we're talking that, you know, there's, you know, there's no obstacle to spending some money. I mean, there's nothing lovelier than a built in barbecue set up outside. Yeah. And honestly, let's really go for it. I had the good fortune to live for 10 years, part of the time in Malibu, California. And I got to see how rich people live. <laughs> I wasn't one of them, I was looking in. But my neighbor had this incredible place. We were on the ocean and he had a pool with his outdoor kitchen and a 50 inch, 70 inch TV out there. And he used to watch his football games out there. You know, the good news he was, he was a uh, who knows? He was. He might have been a Jets fan or something like that. So his <laughs> life was miserable. Yeah. <laughs> I think that outdoor TV is something that if you're doing a flip, it's very easy to have your electrician run to hook up for a TV outside. We've done that on a few projects, and our buyers they they get extremely excited that that we can say there's cable and hookups and power yeah. for an outdoor television. We don't supply it. I'm no. not putting in the no. 75 inch uh, ten thousand dollar TV. Right, but you say that the option's there, you put up a fake one for now and huge value. Outdoor TV is like that. Absolutely, uh, and you know what? When you sell a home, you're selling, you really are selling a dream. 
people envision themselves, I do when I'm buying a place, envision themselves sitting out there with a beer, watching their team. Again, remember, I've spent most of my grown up life in Chicago, so I would know what it's like sitting with a beer depressed, looking at a 75 inch television <laughs> yeah. every Sunday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so allow um, for a lot of extra beer if you're a Bears fan. Yeah, so large cooler outside near your seat. Yeah, <laughs> great idea, right? <laughs> um, Next question came in. So how about home staging? If I'm selling my home and do, if it's a flip, do I need to stage it? And absolutely. if it's my own home, do I have to restage it? Abso so, absolutely. So first part, home you're selling, stage it. I, have, I got in more fights. Like my last year selling real estate as a real estate broker, I sold 897 properties in Chicago. <laughs> and I had a small team. So that's why I'm a lunatic. My brain's gone. But I would fight nonstop through the 90s on staging. It's an absolute must. Then secondly, here comes the delicate bit. When you're selling somebody's home, you got to tell them, hey, your velvet couch isn't crushing it here right now. So you have to restage people. I got to stage late in my career where I didn't mind hurting people's feelings because I told them the truth. I said, listen, your furniture's awful. We need to restage it and put it in storage. So yes to both of those. Nice. Um, a developer, a developer in Boston actually wanted me to ask you, he said, he said he'd heard that you're, you were an expert in Chicago of really recognizing areas that were going to be up and coming and that that was where you really excelled at picking areas. And then they really turned quickly, right, you know, along with your decisions. Um, what did, what did you look for in those areas and coming out of this whole COVID uh, crisis is going to, you know, we're, this will be a, re a first recession for me and for a lot of people, you know, I've been in the business 10 years. Um, okay. Wow. What, wow. Uh, you know, what, what are the things people should look for uh, to, to identify an area to invest? So a couple of things. Firstly, I'm going to touch on the, the fact that I believe in walking around, right? So I walk, every neighborhood I'm interested in. I talk to the neighbors, I see who's rehabbing what, who's doing what, what are the stores going in. There's no replacement for hands-on. I don't mean drive around the neighborhood, I mean you walk the neighborhood. Sure, you get shot at sometimes, but these things happen. <laughs> you know, secondly, I will say to them, uh, there's an expression I love, even a turkey will fly in a hurricane. So I had some good fortune I caught the wave on some markets, but I did, I did spot little changes in the neighborhood. I also learned off neighborhoods in, in, in mile blocks at the time. So I knew every zoning, I knew every niche, I knew every alderman and counselor. I knew my audience and I knew my yeah. market. So there's no replacement for basically doing the homework. So I had the homework done, just like everybody should here now when this virus thing ends, which it will eventually, there'll be incredible pent up demand and opportunity. Have your homework done. Mm -hmm. Also going back to your first and last point, this is obviously a lot of people's first recession. One of the things I've imparted well, I think is you can't teach experience. I got my ass kicked 25 years. I bought a $75 million hotel basically two weeks before September 11th. I lent out a hundred million dollars in my merchant bank in 2007 to fund $1.4 billion of new construction developments for people across America. So I am seasoned. Mm -hmm. I am knocked down and I got up again. So this is incredibly scary time, but there's going to be incredible opportunity. Incredible. Yeah. Can, can you give me a rundown of what you're seeing right now? Obviously a lot of people are scared with the whole COVID thing. From a market's perspective and the real estate perspective, what are you seeing? What is your timeline? Uh, you know, obviously we're looking at maybe hopefully June, we're going to be starting to see people out and about again, but then there's the fear of it coming back again in the fall and, and setting us back again. So what's your, what are you seeing in the real estate space and what's your plan uh, for the next uh, three, six, 12 months? So look, you know, the, the interesting thing about history is it's a window to the future, right? Ultimately, human beings are human beings and they will want to resume living and they will. I don't have a crystal ball when we'll get back out there, but I would agree with you that, you know, you would expect to see things start to happen in June. What I found is an interesting little anecdotal thing, and I've been doing it, is there's lots of people sitting at home online looking at properties. And that's the dream that gets them through these kind of scary times now. They're dreaming about their home. 
So there's a lot of interest percolating. So A, I see some real demand when we get out of here. B, where did you isolate? In your home. Right. What a sales pitch for actually, God damn it, I should have got rid of that shag carpet and those Budweiser <laughs> posters 20 yeah. years ago. So it's, it's making people appreciate a place to shelter much more. There's going to be real pent up demand. I can't say when it will come, but I do think we'll start to see life in the summer. Will it come back? Yes, but here's the thing, like the Boy Scouts would say, be prepared, right? So if we were possibly better prepared for the cycle, we wouldn't have reacted so crazily. It's a deadly serious thing. I'm not downplaying it, yeah. but had we reacted quicker and be better educated about it, there wouldn't be such pan, you know, panic. Yeah. Um, another question we keep getting is coming a mo couple times is, do you think that the virus and being at home for month, two months, three months, is going to change people's expectations of what they get in a home? Are people going to expect an office more or a workout? Like, a, is a home gym going to become more important? Um, and do you think that that's going to change the way houses are built or houses are flipped? I don't think so. There's, there's a segue in that I'm going to. I was asked yesterday by a major publication, you know, this has changed the world of office spaces. And I happen to own some decent office space, so I'm biased. It's wonderful old, you know, tobacco factory loft space and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. I'll tell you who doesn't think it's going to change the way people work. The guy who pays his employees salaries. Now, I have some employees who work at home spectacularly. And I have some who I know are sitting on the couch with a beer. Yeah. Trust me. And the dog's <laughs> licking their face. So yeah. as a guy who pays the salaries, I'm not a fan of working at home. Because yeah. there's no way anyone's as productive. No. You know, the only great thing about Zoom is for the guys who sold all their stock in it two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> I want my employees at work because you can't discount either the energy that comes from a team working together like a band of warriors. Yeah. And you never want to lose that. You celebrate your victories in the office. You communicate so much better. So that's not changing. And either are the way people live in their homes, in my opinion. We've enough comforts. If anything else, we're going to realize we don't need as much as we thought we needed. Yeah. That's what I learned after 2008. Yeah. Nice. So, um, all right, let's keep going through some of these. So, uh, Ordway Jack, shout out to Jack Ordway, asks, uh, which brand and finishes of appliances do you prefer? Okay, so now I have to pitch, do I? I mean, look. Uh, <laughs> When I have a good year, if I won the lottery, I love Sub-Zero, yeah. right? Lots of people love a mealy dishwasher, you know, but I like my American brand, so let's not, let's not sell <laughs> any of them short. So look, yeah. I love stainless steel, right? Okay, I yeah. love a glass. I love a glass-fronted refrigerator. You just nice. have to keep it tidy, Jack. <laughs> you can't have like half empty, you know, food in there. A glass refrigerator works. But I mean, look, mealy and Sub-Zero are very impressive. But yeah. they're really top of the end, right? Yeah. Um, all right. We got uh, Hollywood Beach Living came in and asked, trying to pop a kitchen into a basement, what's the best place for the pipes? How do I handle this with the concrete? <laughs> you don't ask me because I was the worst assistant janitor ever. And you'll notice on the show, I have <laughs> a guy called Lewis, who's an incredibly close friend for a quarter of a century, nearly at this stage. And he figures everything out. So I can't help you there. But I did see that Hollywood was also asking about a wolf oven mm -hmm. and stove. And she's correct. The, the red knobs make that extra cool. So or Hollywood, he or she, I, we don't have a name actually, but Hollywood Beach Living, whoever you are, your taste in stoves is fantastic. But the person you're looking for plumbing guidance from, wrong guy. Um, all right, we got... Um... Modern farmhouse glam is is travertine still the best way to do an outdoor outdoor patio? I love travertine, so let me tell you let me tell you why. Just answer that question quickly. If you've ever visited Italy, and lots of people will, and if you've ever visited Pompeii and some of that, those travertine floors from several thousand years ago are still working beautifully. Yeah, I'll rest my case. Um, we got uh, I'm Coco sixty three. Uh, thanks for the question. We got wood floor colors. What do you, what trends are you seeing and what do you recommend? So I, I'm a big fan of the dark floor. You know, I, I love if I've money, if I had money, I love the mahogany 
floor and the white planks hand scraped. I love walnut. I'm excited to see that uh, Ellen Blair is watching it here, who is the best dressed woman I know. So obviously, uh, I'm sure she knows loads about kitchens. So I never got to discuss a kitchen with her. But she has been to my kitchen and she realized that after 10 years, the plastic wrapping was still in the oven. So I'm not <laughs> the best kitchen expert you've ever seen. So that's a shout out to Ellen Blair. <laughs> Thanks that's for joining Ellen. On the screen. Yeah. Um, what about, so from a hardwood floor perspective, are you, are you using the natural hardwoods or pre-finish and why? Yeah, well, so I, I would use, I use hardwood because the pre-finished, of course, while don't get me wrong, for rentals, you know, obviously the pre-finished. So let's pick our audience. And I know it's mixed. Pre-finished is great for rentals and stuff like that. I still like the original hardwood floors. I think actually that's surprise. Now that you got me thinking on your show, I actually had seen you really do recommend always someone to go with a hardwood and pick a stain. Yeah. And almost yeah. every other show on TV now, they've switched over to just going pre-finished hardwood. Yeah, um, I just... I'm I'm old school, and I think and correct me if I'm wrong. Some hardwood floor expert will jump on here and tell us. But I think that you know you can continue to sand the hardwood floors that I put in, yeah. and have a much longer life. And frankly, they can age beautifully. Yeah. You know, I've had houses where I kind of whitewashed the floor because they were a hundred years old and they came up really cool. You can't do that with a pre-finished, ultimately, right? Right. Yeah, long term, and any knowledgeable buyer who's going to look at the floors, they're going to really understand that the, the true hardwood's the way to go. Um, we've got uh, Don Davis says, what's your preferred black for uh, backsplash in a kitchen? I'm looking at I'm looking at one in here now, and I have a I have kind of nice, very simple, basic herringbone, you know, and again, it's in a stone, a herringbone mm -hmm. sort of pattern. Uh, I like it, but I keep it very simple. I don't like colors, right? So yeah. I don't like colors on the backsplash in the kitchen. So a very simple stone, in yeah. my opinion. Now, people also like the subway tile, and that can look yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. I think subway's a classic. If you're looking to save some money, but you want to put something in that still looks beautiful, going with a subway tile with a gray grout or a white grout is an awesome way to add a lot of value to your kitchen. With You can get those for a dollar a tile. Or even less. And on, on the first show this season, Karen Asopa, who was an incredible hotel designer restaurant, she did this incredible house. You should see the way she picked her tiles. And yeah. then what she did after I, I, I worked with her, she went back and found the exact same fantastic tiles for, you know, 10% of what she was paying. And you should see her finishes. They're fantastic. Yeah, that was a great episode. Make sure everybody yeah. tunes in to all the episodes. You're all at home. This is a great way to learn. This is, you know, anything you want to pick up, definitely tune into all the episodes. Um, we've got Carrie777 asks, what's the best part of tonight's episode on the Deed Chicago? Uh, let me tell you something. So, again, tonight we have another incredibly strong woman. And uh, I'm a huge fan of women in the industry. And let me tell you something. All, all the women sitting at home today should take a hard look at home flipping. There's a misconception that they need to get out there and be Rosie the Riveter do the work. Heads up. I haven't done the work in a long time and none of the guys who claim to do it do the work. The women actually make great home flippers. No egos. So tonight what's wonderful is Leticia is fantastic. She's everything is right about the world. And she, you know, she saved every penny. She was going broke. And she continued to pay her bills. And by the way, long after the show finished, I'd given her a subsequent loan. And she came in every month, a week early to pay it. So I'm, I genuinely get in, engaged with the people on the show. This is, this is incredibly authentic. That's yeah. what makes it so real. It may not be, you know, people like HGTV, it's fantastic too. I'm a little different. Mine is as much about the people as it right. is about the the home and she's incredible so she's fantastic that's the best part tonight who she is and watch her grow and become who she should be awesome great. so so people we, uh, you've had amazing guests on or people on the show you know different you know yes. well, how do those relationships continue over these past couple seasons do you continue to invest with them and, and have they continued to grow their businesses so here i continue to stay in touch with them because my my average real estate deal i'm involved in at this stage is 50 to 100 million dollars right yeah and i advise 
advise companies that are five to twenty billion dollars in the real system. But I've maintained relationships with all of them. We talk, we email. But more interestingly, is uh, last week's episode, Lee View, who's on the show, he's presently working on, you know, restructuring something for a fifteen billion dollar company at Conlonico. I hired him for my real estate merchant bank. Yeah. Off the show. Nice. So he's he's in my life every day. <laughs> So I do maintain relationships, and if they need advice or banks, I will still send them. So again, I, I maintain the relationships, but I don't do home flips with them. Right. Um, all right, let's keep going here. Um, we've got... Do you think people are going to start moving out of large cities? This is a question that we've been getting a ton on our other ones, and this came in again from uh, Hollywood Beach. Um, you know, are people going to be de-urbanizing? Well, I see somebody popped up here, Patty Kelly, who basically helped me set up my first really successful company that grew to do $1.4 billion in sales in two years. And Patty did all the marketing. She's just moved to Miami. So she's so tough. I suspect you'll see a drop in population in Miami because <laughs> she just got there. So there'll be a lot of them moving out. <laughs> but on a serious note, no, I don't. I mean, look, the cities are still, right now it's, it's way too fresh, but cities are incredibly vibrant places. And it's so much life comes out of cities. And I don't think you're going to see people move out of cities. You're going to see a lot of our behavior change as far as, you know, how we deal with pandemics and how we're cleaner with things and stuff like that. But ultimately, cities are vibrant places that people love don't you love new york and london and la and miami and most all oh, chicago so <laughs> you know i don't think so i yeah. might be wrong but i don't believe you're going to see that yeah i, I don't think it's going to happen i don't think this little blip is going to chart and change the complete direction of society i think that um it depends on how long this continues right if this ends in right. june and we start coming out of it if it continues, you know, for another six months, you might people might be begging for more yard space. Right. Um, uh, we got Don Ellsbro asks, uh, "What are your thoughts on GE appliances?" Yeah, you know, I was I was struggling around when I named those super high end ones. I use GE appliances for lots. GE monograms incredible. That's what she so, asked. Yeah, GE yeah. monograms. No, GE monograms are incredible. So you know, I went for what I'd used, and again, repeat, mm -hmm. I lost money in all my. <laughs> personal homes but i'll tell you g monogram fantastic um all right this one comes in from Lori uh white real estate she says do you expect as early 2000s people are taking equity out of their homes are they going to be taking that money out and doing upgrades or are they going to be putting it on the market so uh, is she saying they're taking money out right now uh, yeah, taking out equity lines on their homes. And are they going to be doing renovations or do you think they're going to end up having to sell their properties because they took out the equity lines? Well, so I would say if people are taking out equity lines right now, they're doing that to have a cash caution because they're, you know, abundance of caution preparing for the worst. Yeah. Um, if they're taking that to do home improvements, well, that makes sense, right? And you're at home, you're bored, and everybody thinks they're a handyman. I did actually paint a railing yesterday here. I was quite pleased with myself. But my, my property manager came up. He said, are you painting this or dating it? Because I've been sitting around with a paintbrush for about an hour. So uh, <laughs> to answer your question, I don't fully get the question, but look, some people will have to sell their homes, but hopefully the government is coming up with solutions so people can stay in their homes, not like the last time. And I think what happened last time, remember, good people who paid their mortgages didn't get treated well. And everybody who bailed at the start, you know, um, basically got away with it. Now, I just saw Matt Prisker pop up, and Matt definitely is worse at fixing shit than I am. So <laughs> thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's in some undisclosed location and George Clappers. Um, great. We, I got oh, wait, you know, what, you know what? Actually, we should have George talk. The biggest granite marble guy in Chicago just came on who does all my kitchens. So I'm glad to see he's time to be watching this because he's still really busy. Yeah. Um, so, we got yeah. Uh, Kate, Caitlin Farrell asks, what kitchen hardware finish do you think will stand the test of time? 
again, look, it's not a hard question. I don't like gold. I don't like brass. I'm very basic, you know, with a brush chrome. I think that'll always stand the, you know, stand the time. I mean, sometimes you go with weird shapes, they won't, but I would, the least complicated, the better. The less colorful, the better. Yeah. Um, so when I, so this one came in, when choosing your, uh, for kitchen pendants, right? How do you choose the height off the countertop? And if they <laughs> should be, how many you should place? What I do is I get a really smart electrician <laughs> and Lewis who figure that out for me because while I am good at some of this stuff, I know what I'm not good at. And that's one of the key strengths to being a good home flipper. Leave that to somebody who knows better than you. So I can't answer that question because I'd be making up my answer. And then from when you were getting started, so that's a great segue into this. So I think some people out there, you know, there's a, a definitely some guys who don't have the confidence in making the finishes, the decision on finishes. They, they think they can oversee the construction site on their flip, but they don't have the design decision, you know, feel like they should make the design decisions. When you were getting started, who did you lean on to help you with that part of the business? Well, so when I first started out, um, I obviously, we'd mentioned uh, Patty Kelly here, who actually read every design magazine ever. So she had great ideas. And you've the benefit of when you've sold thousands of homes, which I did in the 90s, of having seen everything, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a really good, you know, opportunity to see what people did. And I had a decent eye for it. So I would say people should read the magazines, you know, an architectural digest. I know some of that's super high end, but you can, you can steal from it, you know, and value engineer it. Right. So I would read a lot of those magazines and then value engineer. And yeah. Like kitchens of Instagram. I mean, look at all the ideas you guys have. I right. mean, Instagram and Pinterest, you could actually design your house off those at this yeah. stage. A hundred percent. I think that's what we recommend to anyone. We say, go and find what's really trendy, what's popular, what people are putting in in other projects. And then you can back into that design. Once you start removing piece by piece, it's very easy to see what went into it. Okay, a white shaker cabinet, a white countertop or quartz countertop. And then it had a marble uh, mosaic backsplash. And you, you can, it might not look exactly the same, but you can get it pretty close. Absolutely. And again, you will see a lot of that in the show. We value engineer everything for a home flip. You value engineer. Um, all right, we got a couple. We'll do a couple more questions yeah. here, guys. Um, what about in the larger building with pet-friendly amenities? This came in from Ordway Jack. Uh, dog walking, sta dog washing stations, things, things that are pet-friendly. Well, I mean, I'm a huge dog fan and uh, grew up with a lot of dogs. And my sister uh, runs our wildlife foundation, so. Uh, massive fan of dogs but again you you have to understand that's a super high-end amenity right yeah so you're talking about a really high-end high-end apartment building that can have dog washing facilities i love the fact the building will allow dogs in it right yeah so let's quit while we're ahead let's not push the envelope too much <laughs> <laughs> great um no i mean that this has been awesome um Thank you so much for your time. Uh, make sure everybody tunes in tonight on CNBC at 10 p.m. Eastern for the D Chicago season finale. Uh, and then throughout the day today, go along, go in and check out the episodes from this season. Um, and if you guys have any other questions, make sure you send them over to us in a DM or to Sean directly on his, uh, on his Instagram. Well, listen, you'll find me tonight on CNBC and obviously Ricky, I, Huge fan of what you guys do, and I do go on to your site and get some ideas. I probably steal them and plagiarize them <laughs> and take credit for them. So thank you very much for having me on. Great. Well, thanks for joining this us, and we'll fun. catch up soon. This is one. Bye, George Kleppers, too. <laughs> thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.